Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 3.30 to 4 p.m. session of the 2017 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder, you can see the full schedule of the conference and see what's coming up tomorrow at conference.opensimulator.org. Feel free to tweet your questions to at OpenSimCC, and you can also use the hashtag, hashtag OSCC17. For this next session, it's called Reevaluating Our Understanding of Content Creation in 3D Virtual Spaces. And our speaker today is Ramesh Ramlal. Ramesh is a PhD, has a PhD in computer science from Lancaster University, UK, a BTEC computer science and engineering from Kanpur, India, is an award winning immersive virtual learning environment pioneer. And during the past 15 years, he designed and implemented virtual reality applications involving 3D sounds and virtual touch for diverse user groups ranging from individuals with cognitive and physical challenges to healthcare providers. Prior to his adventure in the private sector, he was an accomplished academic researcher in areas that include computer-supported corporative work, human-computer interaction, assistive technologies, and telemedicine at universities in Mauritius, England, Scotland, and the United States. He has published extensively in the aforementioned areas of, at mainstream academic venues. He is currently the CEO and CTO at Deep Semaphore LLC, an e-learning and simulation solutions company. And I will pass the mic over to Ramesh. Hello there. Um, you know, thanks for, for, for this introduction. I think I should make it a bit shorter next time. <laughs> All right. Um, well, you know, I mean, you're supposed to write a good one. Anyway, so, so the title is um, Reevaluating Our Understanding of Content Creation in 3D Virtual Spaces. Uh, I've been using OpenSIM um, for, for quite a, a number of years, and um, I had an understanding of, of what content creation uh, was, uh, and, and it seems that it has evolved over time. I, I just wanted to share you know, a few thoughts with you and, and see you know, where, where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm going to start with just a few questions to get us started. Um, you know, it's just uh, like like uh, like a tool I'm using here to uh, to to make you think a little bit. Okay, so the first question I have is: Is content creation in 3D worlds largely an activity mostly relevant to 3D modelers, programmers, building or scripting enthusiasts, or is it a little bit more than than that? Does content creation always precede content use by end users? Uh, do designers always have to build it first before users allow, are allowed to come? Uh, why are we not seeing OpenSIM adopted massively by casual end users? Uh, and I define casual end users as us users who don't want to have anything to do with 3D content authoring or programming, okay? But then that's like like uh, in the morning I was listening uh, to, 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 to a discussion and those were supposed to be, you know, the one, number one dis, um, differentiating factor, you know, for OpenSIM. Um, the, the, the next question is, is content created by end users of a lesser quality than content created by professionals? In fact, uh, a number of years back, um, even, even currently, when often in, in forums you'll find that, okay, you know, this sim doesn't have very good content to, 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 to look at. It's, it's not, you know, that nice. I mean, we should have bring in professional content creators so that we have like a, you know, really great looking world. And in fact, this attitude has, has actually informed how some companies, uh, you know, are, are, are moving forward. And, uh, you know, you can see, uh, you know, sensor and, you know, HF, etc. So the question is, what qualifies that as content, really? So let's let's bring up the next slide. I promise that I'm not going to make this, uh, you know, too um, theoretical on this. I mean, initially I thought I would, but I was, you know, just creating slides like crazy, and I thought that, you know, like 
15, 18 slides about content definition is a bit mad. So I just like this is the 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 you know the the next one would be. Um, oh wow! Okay, let me see here what's going on. All right. So this is the graph I, I just wanted to share with you. And uh, um, well, I hope you can zoom a little bit in and see what's uh, what's on display. But I, I wanted to show, for example, if, if you consider the vertical column and what we are tr I'm trying to display here, if you look at the per percentage of content created in the whole 3D virtual universe, that's everything. Just imagine that you are considering all kinds of worlds, you know, um, on on mobile phones, on HF, OpenSIM, Sumerian, <laughs> and uh, other kinds of uh, virtual worlds. And then you have uh, the on on the horizontal axis, you have generations of virtual environments over time. And uh, what what I wanted to show that uh, that's uh, that's what I what I think you know things might evolve uh, over the the years to come. I think that if you look at the vertical line, it's like, like a snapshot in time. You'll find that, just, just remember the first time you logged into an OpenSIM environment. So you appear with your avatar, and let, let's say it's an empty region. There's nothing there, just the ground and the sky. And, um, and if you want to see, you know, at that point, what's the amount of content that's been created by designers and programmers and the amount of content that you, are crea you have created just by existing and appearing in that world, you can actually see that, you know, you, it's, it's fairly easy to understand that there is much more work and energies that has been spent in developing what you are experiencing at that moment, and you have not started creating anything, anything yet other than representing yourself. And if you type high, maybe that little piece of high text is your content that's being produced. But what, what I think will happen in the future is that if you, I'm, remember I'm, think, I'm talking about percentages here. We will see more users creating you know, content beyond just you know, chatting or texting or animating the afters. Or even if you are, remember, we are considering all kinds of virtual environment. Even if you are going around shooting at things, uh, changing environments by shooting and destroying your environment, those those can be considered as casual content, you know, that you're creating. In terms of information, you're changing the world and maybe making it more interesting for others. But that's just the, the casual content creation part. But over time, we'll find that better tools will become available that will actually empower users to start uh, having much more influence in those environments. And that's what drives uh, what all, all our designs you know, throughout. Um, so in the previous talks for OSCC, I talked about the Resmela system, which we won't have time to discuss uh, today, but today there's another little um, object uh, that we design that will kind of illustrate what I'm trying to, to, to point at, okay, in, in terms of, of what we consider content and how we can get, actually get more users, create content, and turn the whole OpenSIM uh, platform into a mass-facing one. Just try to bring in users beyond our traditional community of users, which mainly, by and large, are designers and, and people who are familiar with advanced editing tools, okay? Um, We'll revisit this graph at the end of my presentation. Uh, that, that's another graph, and you might see that it actually the trend lines look very similar. Maybe there is a kind of relationship between those two slides that I've just shown. But if you look at the evolution of productivity of a user in a, um, you know, uh, for actually this would stand true for any application. And, uh, if if you if you actually have to spend a lot of time to learn an application before you can actually use it, then I w I wouldn't count this application as as being like a productivity tool because you're spending so much time learning about it and the, and then what you produce I mean the amount of time left that you have to produce anything is so small that that becomes the the learning becomes like a bottleneck okay so over time. You want to actually improve things. You want to increase the percentage time users spend creating, generating, assembling, modifying things that they actually want. 
and you want users to sp spend less time having to learn and use tools. Um, so let's zoom into a specific tangible example and then try to anchor those ideas in this example. Okay. Uh, let us say we have uh, you know the task of creating a 3D virtual museum. Okay, just consider this task problem. And what we are trying to do, the two things that we need in order to achieve this task is to go find forage for information about a, whatever topic of interest you have chosen. And then once you get those information, the second step is to organize the displays to present the information in, in a 3D space. Okay. So um, the question that I can ask, we can ask ourselves is, how would we do it in OpenSIM right now? And then how might it be done in the future? Actually, we, are, we have already done it. So, uh, but, but you know, just as an example, but we can have many more different iterations in the future, but just to separate those two. So in OpenSIM, you can imagine people going and, and looking for all this information on the web, I swear, recording, creating content, and then they would create the, the museums, you know, the traditional way, pushing, pulling prints or importing mesh objects and things like that, and then they set up the museum. Okay, what, what, what's a slightly different way of doing this? So let's remind ourselves of the broad objectives, okay, that we set for us, ourselves. Our goal is to provide users with an application that will allow them to create a 3D virtual museum as easily and as fast as they would create a PowerPoint presentation. Um, just uh, sorry for this metaphor, but I didn't have anything else. Uh, I do know PowerPoint is not the big deal and, and, and in some quarters it's even hated, but I couldn't find a better example. So um, we want to bring down the workload for using tools so that they can users can spend most of their time and resources, cognitive otherwise, to actually, you know, craft their presentation. Okay, let's say the, that percentage of total time for the task allocated, let's say, let's say that's like 95%, and uh, you want the percentage of time uh, to actually create the, the museum environment to be only 5%. That is, you know, like you're creating the 3D objects. You want, you want those, that's your target. So that, again, users get to spend more time on the actual things, finding content, and, 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 and focusing on, on what they really want. Okay, so if you have 100 minutes to create the museum, you'll have 95 minutes to create, to find the media you want, and then you have five minutes to organize this content into, your, into the 3D museum, and then bring your friends in, or you know, visitors and things like that. So this is an object that we built. It's like a one prime mesh cube. It's kind of an interesting object, and uh, um, inside the cube, just imagine that you're going to have the museum inside it, okay? I'm using museum as a metaphor. It could have been like a poster, setup, or anything, but I thought museum was more generic. And, and, and the inside surfaces of the cube are actually images that's obtained from uh, Google Street View, okay? Pretty much you just have to specify the location you're interested in, and that's going to bring uh, all the images in. And recently, uh, you know, we found that uh, all images work, uh, at least that's, that's created both by users or by Google, even images that's been produced before. So you can actually see the same object across different times. And uh, let's go and, and see the next slide. Um, on, on, on the picture on the right, you can see um, that there are partitions on, on the floor. Uh, just imagine you're in a museum and you see all these partitions, and it's like uh, they are surfaces on which you can place media. It can be pictures, it can be video, it can be text, and uh, you can place them in that museum. And then you have a HUD in that application. Oh, wow, five minutes remaining, according to my watch. 15 minutes, I've, I've spoken 15 minutes. All right, so um, so you have, you know, these pictures and, and text that uh, you, you, you can use and, um, and you have a HUD that allows you to pick those objects and just place it. There's no inventory access at all. Everything is, is happens within, you know, the, this cube. 
uh, and, and then you get to you have the possibility of loading um, you have the possibility of loading uh, various templates that would set up any kind of design uh, uh, you want in any kind of of way you know somebody has decided to place those those different partitions in that space. So the museum that I created here was for a specific topic. It was the Manhattan Project. Like during the Second World War, people were involved in designing the, the, the first two atomic bombs. And I spent my time just finding those information very quickly and added all this information inside the 3D space. And I can walk around in the 3D space and bring people in and they can follow the story. In fact, this, this space is like a, a 3D mind map of, of the curator. Uh, uh, of of these uh, information things. All right, so uh, you will find if you look very closely at those at those images, there are a number of buttons like the ring, the circular disk. Those are if you click on those, that would actually bring uh, you know an immersive uh, panoramic view of uh, you know of of events that happened at that location. So in this case, you know I'm, I am actually facing posters talking about the American Japanese internment, and you can actually click on on the on these discs and bring up and see the actual buildings that they were living in, and you can go inside the buildings, and and it's all in an immersive environment. Um, you can have different types of templates that you can just click and load, and it's pretty much like uh, you know you're loading a PowerPoint slide template, and you just add text or images, and you just click and produce your your presentation. So it's the same idea, okay? So in this case as well, you can see that there are some text templates that you can add information in, and uh, and uh, you know the images and and things like that, and you can create very quickly. You know the, the the museum piece. Okay, so what are the advantages of this approach? Um, so first, we have productivity gains, and then you have you know collaborative opportunities raised. So if you look at productivity gains, uh, you use, users are able to create the three D virtual museum quickly in the same time they would have spent to create a PowerPoint slide presentation. And content can be produced more. Can, the content that's produced, that's something that I've experienced. When I create like a museum this way, I can actually remember the whole thing in that space. I know which section has which information, and it's a great memory aid for me if I am to give a presentation, but because I can navigate in my head and see which posters are displayed where, et cetera. So, so, so that's a different experiment for another day when we are going to look at memory loss, extra. So if anyone is interested in doing that kind of research, get in touch with me because we don't have time to do those types of studies. The, the second part is about collaborative uh, opportunities. That's too obvious. So I'm going to move to the last slide, uh, the one before the last. Again, to speed up transfer of information from the desktop, the browsers, or anything that you do on the 2D desktop, you have extensions that we have developed for Chrome, and you can just click on those extensions, and all that information gets sent directly in world. So that saves you the time to actually import. No, well, you don't. In our system, we, we never need to import pictures. You don't deal with textures. Everything is URL based, and uh, you know. So everything is automatic. The only thing you focus on is content you want to present. The objects are produced automatically. You know, you can load from templates. You don't even need to arrange objects if you don't want it. If you are more adventurous, you can create your own arrangements and save it as a template file that you can share with somebody else. So what I was trying to get at here is, let me drink some water here. Well, you see, um, what I was trying to say is that the evolution has to be like you're trying to move this green bar to the right. You want users to be to be to to actually have a bigger share in content creation than developers. That would be the sign of a successful system. That would be the sign of a successful platform, and that's where the creativity needs needs to go. What I am seeing is in the industry and elsewhere, millions, billions of dollars are being spent on focusing on other, on things other than that, okay? So it's a great opportunity for us to focus on these things 
and uh, you know, and try to move things forward. Thank you for your attention. Is there any question? All right, Ramesh, thank you so much. Very informative. And we do have time for a question or two. Does anyone have a question? You know, and I wanted to t mention while we're waiting for a question, um, the setup ahead of time for the museums is fantastic. And um, it really helps create spaces so nicely. Um, that's a great idea. Just one thing, the object that I've displayed here, these are actually in itself like a, a Resmila library object. So if you use the Resmila system, you could actually have bring all the various, you know, many students in at the same time and create their own little, you know, as it were, the little museums. And then you have one big museum that you can visit together, etc. So um, it's whatever I presented here was is linked to the bigger system that we presented in, you know, in the previous years. Um, uh, but do feel free to get in touch with me. Send me an email to r.remlull at gmail.com. We really need more people, you know, and uh, I'll be happy to add more people to our team. Thanks. And we do have a question from Matilda. Matilda is asking, what was the part about the uploading easily? There is no upload. Ah. Yeah. No upload at all. All the images that you see there displayed, that's uh, straight from a URL. If it's even if you have, uh, um, you know, you're not dealing with textures, you're not dealing with uh, with those type of, of things. So inside the museum, you have like a library of objects, like panels that you can place, light sources that you can place. Um, you know, you have little mini browsers that you can place and and point to places. Uh, all the surround views that you see, that's point straight to Google Street Views, so you don't upload anything. Great. And um, give me the uh, email again, please, so I can put it in here for everybody. I'm just going to type in. It's okay, already. Great. Okay. There we go. All right. All right. Well, Ramesh, so, thank you so much for joining us. And you, will you be in a booth then after this for people to ask other questions if they had come up with them? Um, actually, I'm going for dinner right now. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Little... <laughs> <laughs> but you can email him your questions if you have them. That would be great. Sure. All right. Well, um, thank you, Ramesh. And I wanted to remind the audience again, um, coming up at 4.30, uh, we have a session entitled MoCap Dance Library, an animation resource for transdisciplinary arts research in the metaverse. And also encourage you to, in the break, uh, stop by the different expo uh, sims. Um, OSCC 17 Poster Expo is on OSCC Expo 3 region, um, and you can try all the different ones. So thank you again, and we will see you back here at 430